another thing is we were discussing last night is, is camouflage. Most people don't understand camouflage. What it's intended to do, it, it's not to look make you look like something, make you look like a tree or a bush. It's to make you look like nothing. It's to make you blend in to the train like you're not there. And there are ways to do that, but you need to understand what it is you're trying to create and how to create that illusion of not being there, not being there. That three-dimensional, they can see through you. They can see into you. You're not there. So how do you do that? A lot of it has to do with creating textures, relative brightness, color balance, depending on what you're hunting. Uh, deer and stuff, the relative brightness is more important than the, than the color balance. So having your background in, uh, as a doctor of optometry, you can speak with some authority on how vision works. Well, can you tell us a little bit about that? Particularly even more than that. Uh, when, when I was in school for taking uh, physiological optics, our instructor was a fellow named Robert Peckham. And he had worked with the military in World War II on developing camouflage. And physiological optics can be a, not the most enthralling subject. But uh, he loved to talk about his great passion, which was camouflage. Hmm. And so if we were having a class and it was kind of dull, you could ask him a question about thinking he started on camouflage, and he'd spend his whole two hours of lecture talking about camouflage, different things. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he's one of the guys that helped come up with the zigzag pattern they used on the ships in World War II to break up their outline and the gradient shading they used on airplanes so that they, uh, uh, when you put spotlights on them at night, you couldn't really see the plane well. Uh, and, and he's the one, one of the people that was on the team that figured out that people that are true colorblind, rod monochromats, not just red green deficient or something, printed camouflage patterns stand out as artificial. And the military recruited these people in World War II to, to read these aerial photographs. Because other people with normal or semi-normal color vision would look at them and they couldn't figure out what was there. And these rod monochromats could look at that same picture and say, well, this is camouflage netting covering up something, and this is something that camouflage. And they could spot it instantly, stood out like a sore thumb. Hmm. So and is that why maybe the more printed camo or something that's flat without texture has a hard time? That's it. Okay. The, the, the flat image, you want to look like when an animal approaches you, like he could pass through you. Think of it, an animal knows the difference between a solid log laying there and a bush that he can push his way through. He, he recognizes instantly the difference. Mm -hmm. You want to look like that bush. You don't want to look like that log. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be a flat pattern. You must have depth. And that's what printed camouflage lacks. And when I, I've tried a lot of the printed camouflage patterns through the years, and from a practical standpoint, you're as well off using plaid wool shirts or and, and you know gray clothes uh, great work clothes they they do as well as most camouflage patterns uh, even tie-dyed stuff you can make camouflage that's as good as anything you can buy in a flat printed pattern just by tie-dying stuff you could have hunting hippies yeah <laughs> absolutely and for the deer hunter like I said color is not important what's important is relative brightness most people know, don't even understand what relative brightness is. But you need to get the relative brightness of whatever you're wearing balanced to the relative brightness of the background. It's actually easy to do if you know how to do it. But you need, particularly with today's equipment, with cameras that will take both color and black and white photos, you can balance this contrast, this relative brightness, with a black and white photo. And you can balance the color with a color photo. Okay. So if you take a picture black and white and a color picture and analyze them both and if you're blending well on that's both, right you want to take your good. camo and put it against the terrain you're hunting in mm -hmm. and if you're hunting in varied terrain you know this two or three different shades like we've got here you know gray backgrounds with this dead stuff and occasional green bushes and so forth uh, you want to put it against the different backgrounds and look and see if it how it blends in with each one of them and take that color photo and then take that black and white photo mm -hmm. and see what you got and the one thing I found with most camo is that it's too dark 
the yeah. relative brightness is not correct. Yeah. You, you need to get that relative brightness balanced up, and we don't see it because we have color vision, like predators do. So if you're hunting a predator, you need, the color is probably as important as the relative brightness. But on deer animals and animals that are basically rod monochromats, what, relative brightness is what counts. You can get oranges and blacks color balanced against a green background, and it's just as good as, as having a color match as far as the deer are concerned. Mm -hmm. Because they're seeing the relative brightness, not the color. So a lot of camouflage companies, or maybe not a lot, but I've seen a few have kind of caught on to this fact of relative brightness and taking their pictures in black and white and trying to balance that out, um, which is a good step forward. Now, one question I have is if you're hunting deer, say, or some animal that's a monochromat that cannot see color, why is it important to get the color right in the camouflage as well, or does it matter that It, it doesn't matter that much on a rod monochromat, right. but it, birds have color vision, all the predators have color vision. Mm -hmm. So anytime you're dealing with those, you need to have it balanced. The ideal thing is to have both balanced all the time because you can be hunting deer and here comes a coyote. <laughs> there you go. You know, you don't want the coyote or you don't want a crow sitting in the tree, <laughs> you know, spooking off everything. So you, you ideally need to get the whole thing balanced. Mm -hmm. But you'll never, even when they balance the relative brightness, you'll never get that flat print to have three-dimensional depth. You must have shadows, create real, genuine shadows that gives you that illusion, illusion of depth. Okay. And that's where effective camouflage really comes into its own. So how do you do that? Uh, the best thing that I've found are ghillie suits, but a lot of the commercial ghillie suits, they might be perfect for one terrain, but they're not going to be where you can use them in different terrains. I, I tended to make my own, and I made several of them depending on the terrain where I was hunting. And I made them out in the field, in the terrain where I was going to hunt. And you build them up thread by thread using yarns and things like that and building up little not only long strands but little tufts that create shading and shadow and that gives you that illusion of nothingness of three dimension like looking at a, a juniper tree or a pine tree or something. there's depth into it we have uh, the military snipers use ghillie suits absolutely because it's the most effective camouflage out there Right. Now, they tend to do theirs with uh, natural vegetation from the area where they are. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, they're shooting rifles, not a bow. Mm -hmm. And natural vegetation, with a few exceptions, there are things you can add in, which I've done at times, mosses and things like that, to add into my ghillie suit. But a lot of the things are not really practical for the bow hunter. Because you don't want twigs sticking out all over you and yeah. big clumps of grass and so forth. So the, the sniper's camouflage there is a little bit better, or a little bit different than, than the hunter would. But uh, with all of the yarns that are out there, and the best yarns are, are the natural fibers. Uh, wool yarns work very, very well. Jute thread, which the military does use as a base on their coat, uh, works very well. Because they don't have the glare that some of the, the synthetic fibers do, synthetic yarns and so forth. Um, that tends to help some. You can make a very effective uh, ghillie suit out of acrylic yarn and so forth that you buy at Walmart. You can make a better one if you go to a craft shop somewhere and get a wool yarn and use that for your base. And then if you want to add in a little bit of natural vegetation here and there where it's not going to affect you, that's perfect. You need to cover everything though. You know, you need a hat that can be camouflaged that becomes part of your outfit. It needs to be matched to the rest of the suit. Uh, I use a, a poncho type when I construct mine, and I'll wear a, a printed camo t-shirt under it. But I add to that. I add little tufts of yarn and so forth that stand up an inch tall or so that will cast shadows 
so was to break that outline to make it match. And I use a lot of those on the chest area where my bowstring is going to be passing by. So I don't have long threads that might be caught. And I generally leave a little bare area along my forearm because I don't want the string even hitting little tufts and so forth in there. Right. So sniper style ghillie suits are going to be a little different than a bow hunter's ghillie suit because you need the function of being able to move that's through right. the brush and shoot upright rather than laying on your stomach. That's right. They're, they, Their most important thing is to have you know, their face and their back particularly yeah. camouflage well with the ghillie suit. Mm -hmm. As a stalking bow hunter or a bow hunter that's in a stand, you need your whole camo suit camouflage one way or another. So it is a, a different structure, but you're trying to apply the exact same techniques. And like I said, when you're building that, you know, using your yarn stuff, the last thing you work with are the very strong colors, black and white. And you need those to do the color balance, the relative brightness uh, balance of it. And when you take that black and white photo, you'll know instantly, I need, this is too dark, I need to add more white. If you get, you get it too light, it only takes a little bit of black to change that. Hmm. So these are your two strongest colors. And you start with neutral colors. I usually start with a gray base, usually two colors, gray, dark gray, light gray. And I'll build up from there. And depending on the terrain, I might have you know, some oranges and burnt oranges. and I might have dark greens and light greens. Uh, it makes a difference whether you're hunting tropical terrain with thick green vegetation or whether you're hunting the high desert with a lot of yellows in it. Or there are places where there's orange dirt. <laughs> and you, you need orange in your suit. Yeah. So you, you build that suit for that terrain that you typically hunt. And I, I always carried stuff with me. I camouflage my bows too, and there are techniques for doing that. And uh, uh, I would carry, I would usually use a permanent camo on there that I did with uh, artist acrylic paints, using various techniques to give different textures, and so forth on the bow. But I always carried uh, auto paste wax and food colors. So when I went to a different terrain, I could touch up an outer coating on this to balance the camouflage of the bow to the terrain. And that that's easy to remove without removing your acrylic. Okay. And you can get the acrylic off the bow if you have to. Yeah. It just takes a little bit of elbow grease. But yeah. You can get it off okay. without damaging the bow. Yeah. So you don't have to worry too much about doing that. But uh, literally you can get a bow where you can put it against the terrain and you do the same thing. You photograph it white and color and you can get it balanced where it just blends into nothing it's just not there wow. there are wrapping techniques you do with the with the texture stuff around the edge of the bow and so forth mm -hmm. that gives you some of that three-dimensional effect that you don't get off of just something that's flat well it's it's a it's an asset that yeah adds to your ability. Right. You know, a really good stalker is, is going to do pretty well regardless. Even like I said, even with plaid shirt on, he's going to do pretty well. But until you have worked with ghillie suits that are built the way they should be, you don't understand how close you can get to animals. I've had animals at, at two or three feet stand and stare right at me and never see me. That's amazing. Not even know I was there had birds light on me numerous times. Um, they, they think you're a, a tree or a part of the normal habitat. So they don't hesitate at all to land on you. So you have to be prepared for that kind of stuff to happen too. That's amazing. <laughs> well, thanks, Ed, for sharing your information on uh, ghillie suits and camouflage and stalking. And I think that'll be a great help to uh, bow hunters, especially on down the line. I appreciate you sharing your wisdom with us. Well, my pleasure.